Welcome to the IBM Podcast Network. I always believe stories find you. You know, it's uh, they they choose you as mediums to be told. Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to Anything But Bollywood, where we talk to creators, filmmakers, and curators of the moving images. But it's with one condition that they be working in spheres that are anything but Bollywood. So, having said that, Bollywood is this ginormous monster that devours everything that's in its path, and we're podcasting out of Mumbai. So, we will invariably bump into people who have a toe or a finger or a foot in uh, Bollywood. So, to deal with this contentious issue, we're introducing you to our anything but Bollywood scoring, uh, also known as ABS. So an Anand Patwardhan gets a 10-pack and a Salman Khan gets a 0-pack. So our guest this week has a 9-pack ab rating. She was featured as one of 12 international players to watch in the Hollywood Reporter's 2012 Women in Entertainment special. She is a BAFTA nominee. She's had a film nominated for the Oscars. She is the producer of Gangs of Vasipur, The Lunchbox, Masan, Peddlers and many, many more films. She's Guneet Monga. Hi Guneet, welcome to the show. Thank you so much Neha. Very excited to be here. Thanks for coming. Uh, how? So I wanted to start by asking you, how did this journey into filmmaking begin? I know you grew up in Delhi and you had done a mass communication course. Mm-hmm. So how did that journey begin for you? I mean, I was um, always interested in communication and I was assisting my best friend's mother, um, Anurita Segal. I was her intern's intern, like I was just the extra hands in the office and she was in uh, international films. How old were you at this point? 17. Oh, okay. Um, but through school and through college, I saw her work on international films and I always wanted to just, you know, hang out and assist. And her office was just so amazing, treated everybody as equals and gave a lot of importance to interns. So it was just really motivating to work with a bunch of people who were so encouraging. Mm. And I think that's how I just stumbled onto production and uh, just kept growing and learning what do I need to do so I started as literally an intern's intern and uh, moved up to being a intern official intern in Valley of Flowers which was my first which was again I was um, Anu auntie's uh, assistant mm. uh, Prina Segal who's my best friend her mother mm. uh, Anurita Segal um and then I went on to be a production coordinator, location manager, then production manager, and then uh, worked a lot for five, six years in Delhi and uh, raised some money, came to Bombay, wanted to invest into movies and uh, figure out how to be a producer. So that's really how it started. So that was a big step then to just show up in Bombay? Actually, even then I think it goes back to Prerna because she was finishing her FTII. Uh, editing course and uh, she was moving to I didn't do post-graduation mm. all my friends did post-graduation so I straight went into working from graduation um, and uh, she was moving from her college to Bombay mm. and all my other friends were also moving so it was pretty um, in to mm. move you know right. and we were all very excited about getting a house and starting our lives it was almost like a a uh, virtual game that we were playing of you know of, of finding houses of l- leaving our parents house um, mm. leaving the comfort zone of Delhi mm. and coming here we got a 1 BHK in uh, Gorigao West and Prina and I shared it and that's how Bombay happened and it was pretty we romanticized the struggle you know mm. it was fun so at this point you were still what, in your 20s right yeah, yeah. When I came to Bombay, I was twenty. Yeah, I was twenty. <laughs> wow! And so you had come to Bombay, I believe, with money and which you had borrowed from a neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> and you had come there, a twenty-year-old, ready to produce a film. Seventy-five lakhs. Wow. I came and I was doing meetings in uh, Infinity Mall food court, and I was meeting all kinds of people and saying, "I have money. Do you want to pitch me a story?" So mm-hmm. I was that stupid mm-hmm. and naive. But mm-hmm. yeah. But I met lots of people, all kinds of people, shady people, fun people, all kinds of people. 
and I was uh, also very naive, of course, you know, mm. just meeting everybody, telling everybody, I have access to money, can can we make a movie, and can do you have a story? So I would just, you know, I met lots and lots of people. And how did uh, Say Salam India then happen? So also during our meetings, got introduced to Subhash, and uh, he had a children cricket film idea, and he also had access to a similar amount of money, and we just joined hands, and we both uh, kind of raised half half money and invested in together and i was excited about a cricket film because 2007 was world cup and this was in 2006 that when i was moving and doing these meetings still going back and forth from delhi and bombay so yeah we made the film in 2006 did anyone question you at that point question your age question your experience um i think a lot of people have always questioned my age mm Uh, I think we live in a very ageist place. Mm. It's more ageist than even gender biased. You know, here I, I really feel you that. You feel that I, even more. I feel the age issue is a larger than life issue. Mm. That you're young, to me, what is it? You know, it's mm. more like you don't know anything. You're young. So yeah, I faced a lot of age issues, and uh, I've just you know kept working. I mean, just just put your head down and keep working. They reached a point in my late twenties when I used to. Try and look like forty. Mm. Uh, I had coloured my hair white. I used to wear sarees into meetings. Really, you coloured your hair white? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I was proud of when everybody used to say, "Are you thirty eight, forty?" And I used to quietly look at them and say, "Hmm, yeah." I used to never commit. Mm. <laughs> I used to love the mm. ambiguity, mm. and I used to look older. Mm. So just because it was always just so tough to get over this age barrier, mm. and 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 as a producer, you know. Mm. It's very judgment. So actually, now you've actually had a physical transformation completely, yes. <laughs> and now this is what has driven it. Now it all makes sense. Yeah. So my thirties, I'm now trying to live my twenties. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's how you dealt with the with the age. Yeah. Uh, so can you tell us about Say Salam India? Because I know you had a very interesting journey with that. Yeah, it was great fun. I mean. working with subhash and working on this film i was uh, that time working with my that time producing partner hari shamin um who was instrumental in bringing me from delhi to bombay and uh, we had a blast shooting the film casting shooting the film since milan suman sanjay suri i still remember milan suman was in uh, valley of flowers where i was an intern and mm. that time i used to say one day i will work with him that was Like a huge, huge ambition, and the first check that I wrote in my life as a producer was to Milan Suman, and I keep telling him this story. <laughs> so you know, just and he was very kind, and everybody that I had worked with uh, out of um, Delhi when I was in Delhi, like Vinay Pathak, and just everybody that I would make casting calls to, because I was only a part of international film community mm. in Delhi, and I was I was working in that community for four years or something. So everybody that I worked from from there, I knew people here, and everybody helped me in making my film happen. And um, it was great. I mean, working and making the film was all amazing. But uh, it released in two thousand seven when India lost the World Cup, mm. and that was the Friday it 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 uh, lost from I think Bangladesh, and there were people in India who died of heart attack. There was so much at stake for that World Cup. Wow. and our movie had released around that weekend and uh, all the theater owners sent the prints back so it literally was a release which just nobody wanted to talk about cricket it mm. was so bad so it released just after the loss it released and then uh, india, india lost within mm. that week mm. and then nobody wanted to show up for cricket mm. so it kind of released but was uh, the worst time that anybody can come in with no fault of ours mm. So we kind of devised um, a mechanism of, um, and it was of course our neighbor's money, and mm. I had to cross his house to go to my house. Like he was on the first floor and I was on the second floor. And uh, yeah, his name is Kamlesh Agarwal, and I still remember. And uh, we kind of devised a mechanism of doing school shows, subha nau se bara ke shows, and we did. Lots and lots of shows, like 150 plus shows, mm -hmm. and uh, there were 50 rupees per ticket booked in single screens, and we made our money back, and we paid our investors back. What was it in you that kind of drove you to just, you know, make it all up as you went along? 
it was completely making it all up uh, it was completely like freestyling and how selling the interval to brands for an extra 10000 rupees selling uh, 50 rupees per ticket and i i don't know what drove me oh, yeah exactly what drove me was that how will i ever go back home mm. and i think somewhere he given me the money because uh, he knew my parents and just that obligation was too much and i used to tell um, there were people who used to say that you know in business there's losses and there is gains and it's all fair people signed a deal you don't have to kill yourself or hate yourself because it's business it's fair trade but i was like no you know if in my first project if i lose money then i will never go back to this i have to find a way to make this back it took 9 months of my life mm. i was in delhi doing school to school shows one school to activate takes a week you go to the principal you write a letter they only meet you in the recess and then they write a letter to all the teachers then they write to students then they go back to their parents they collect the 50 rupees per kid mm. they come back collected then i have to book a single screen i have to book what time morning so it's a lot of work when you right. get to doing it but um uh yeah but from one school to another we went from strength to strength and the buzz spread and these were house full pre book shows and mm. uh, kids loved it it was a very good film it had all the high points of an underdog winning and you know but it just went completely unnoticed mm. also our distribution doesn't really allow for independent films to thrive or to grow from week to week anyways it is so skewed right so when there's an calamity outside when india freaking came out of the first round of world cup mm-hmm. um there was so much money on stake by brands put in so there was always this conversation ki first round mein thoda harenge you know they go from first three matches to the next and then reaching up to mm-hmm. quarter finals semi finals finals but um yeah it was a bad time so after you moved to bombay after say salam india you mm-hmm. you worked in a lot of films and then you met uh, anurag kashyap and you worked ended up working with him for 5 years so what were your biggest learnings from working with anurag i mean i came to bombay in 2006 and 7 and i've started working with anurag in 2009 mm. and uh, between that i'd produced the sridhanya right that was a lovely film thank you it was a lovely film i still thank remember you. it i saw it in your filmography and that kind of stood out for me that film yeah it was great working with vinesha and shashank and everybody um and then i'd line produced uh, once upon a time in mumbai and rangrasia and because of rangrasia i um, would um, Ketan sir started Ketan Mehta the director of Rangrasi has started a group called IIFW Indian Independent Filmmakers Worldwide and all the independent filmmakers used to meet um second saturday at Ketan sir's office and uh, it started with me hanging out and taking information in everybody would come uh, there was Sudhir Mishra Raja Menon Anurag you know lot Ankur Tiwari lots and lots of lots of uh, very good filmmakers and voices would come and everybody would talk about how we can actually do something and maybe make a association a union and have different policies is a great effort by ketan sir and uh, that's where i actually interacted a lot with anurag and uh, then i went on to work for balaji and and we met again there and he was working on um, uh, that girl in yellow boots mm. and um, and uh, i happened i started working with him on that girl in yellow boots and we just started as um, i was an associate producer on the film and uh, started by executing one film and by the end of yellow boots um, he said that you know let's make a company you run it let's make more films um, you produce more work i'm not uh, keen in production uh you see how you want to build this and what you want to do so it was very very kind of him to give me that opportunity mm-hmm. and uh, i was uh, over the moon and i just always wanted to just you know do a good job so that you know he can be proud of it mm-hmm. so it is always a huge responsibility it was always high pressure mm-hmm. um and uh, then five years went into just working just working on some 17 18 films together lots of first time directors and lots of international co-productions lots and and kept learning and he would keep pushing me also and when we did yellow boots i remember um it got selected in venice mm. in 
and that was my first film festival and venice and toronto it was back to back mm. venice and toronto happened one week apart from each other so um we went to these film festivals and and we would always hear that you know in film festivals people films get sold but a screening happened and then i was like now how does the sales happen So I went up to the director of the film festival and I said why are buyers not meeting me mm-hmm. where are, where do they sit how who do I talk to mm-hmm. and he very politely told me you need to you need to give yourself 3 years to know how this market works who these people are they just don't it doesn't happen like this mm-hmm. and I was like why you know how I think the ultimate goal for a filmmaker was to show up at a film festival but then you really have to work a month before for any sales to happen and you have to work with sales agents and then you talk wire of him all this I had no idea about and then when i came back to bombay after um uh venice and toronto a lot of thought went into what did we do how we should have done this how we should have worked a month before we had no idea nobody had ever done it before mm. there was no precedence so i decided to go back to france um and meet everybody uh all the big sales agents and everybody before not on a festival week or anything but mm. in their offices and for 5 years i did that every year in all the film capitals of the world so new york la london paris and i mm. kept going and i kept meeting people and i kept telling them about indian independent cinema i kept telling them that there is a world beyond bollywood they would just look at me and say oh you're an indian you're from bollywood mm. and i would be like yes there is bollywood but mm. then there is also us Mm. and i would make pen drives of our company and rakesh films with all the films in it it's kind of mm. illegal to do it but how else you can't like leave five dvds back mm. so uh, i would just like you know show up and keep uh, meeting everybody and then meet them again in festivals mm. so somewhere over a period of time a network got formed and and a lot of people were very kind and introduced me to a lot more people and now it's reached a point where one can sell one can do trading one can understand okay this film is good for that person and to call this person mm. you learn about people's tastes you learn about what excites them and it's education you know mm. and uh, i'm excited that i got this opportunity while working with anurag and uh, and i think my i i think the biggest learning was to continuously stay hungry and stay curious mm. and keep exploring because we went into an uncharted territory mm. Yeah. And and what was it at that point with that girl in yellow boots like what was driving that decision because up to that point I don't know the festival market was not something that y'all had explored at that point. So at that point what was it that why did y'all turn kind of and look outwards? And nobody really wanted to buy yellow boots in India. And um, Anurag uh, also at the start of it was very clear that um I mean I I really think that Black Friday could have traveled that much or Gulal could have traveled and he had over his career he had a lot of production and producer issues where so many years his films did not release mm. so it was almost like he really wanted his movies to travel mm. and uh, when Yellow Boots did get selected it was uh, an opportunity for us to now be validated at a festival and then I also assumed that it is my job that now that we are here what do we do it's not just about whining and dining and having a great screening how do i take this forward mm. how do i convert this opportunity into sales and that's what drove me into meeting people knowing them and you know educating because i mean we didn't know how sales agents work and how many years the deals are what the percentages are what are the countries that our films will be bought in because there is a huge diaspora market which bollywood has really well established in right but how does even one start selling films in non diaspora and then when you start selling how much do you sell it in and then how do you come back and balance that out so it is you know it was a lot of um, first time and a lot of questions yeah okay we're going to take a small break and uh, when we come back we're going to talk about uh, the lunch box which was sure. a big success for you Hi, I'm Amit Verma, the host of the weekly podcast The Scene and the Unseen. In my show, I examine the scene effects and the unintended consequences of public policy and private action. I show how policies meant to help the poor often end up hurting the poor. 
I've done episodes so far on demonetization, GST, surgical strikes, immigration and MRP. And I will continue my forensic assault on the truth in the weeks to come. Catch the show every Monday on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you prefer. Or visit seenunseen.in for all the latest updates. We are back on Anything But Bollywood and we're talking to Guneet Monga and we're going to talk about uh, Lunchbox, which is a huge success story. Uh, it had Irfan Khan and Nimrit Kaur. And I wanted to know, it wasn't a huge film in terms of scale. Uh, so why did you choose then to go into co-production of that film? I mean, you had raised money for films in India. So what was driving that choice? So I had done a producing course Um Actually, it's kind of a scholarship, the TAP program, Transatlantic Partnership. And uh, that allowed me to understand co-productions. It's a three-week course for only working professional producers who have at least produced two films each. And uh, it has 21 candidates. So six from Europe, six from US and six from Canada. Okay. And only three from the rest of the world. Oh, okay. So Asia, Africa, Australia. Uh, and I was one of the three um, and that was spread over three weeks in a year um, and you had to keep going back to it was Berlin, Halifax in New York mm. and it was spread over three weeks and we were meeting real producers, lawyers it was very like it was a very uh, extensive, expansive workshop with mm. uh, people from the industry coming and talking to producers that opened up my world into co-productions. I understood how co-productions work. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd got chosen from Film Bazaar, which is the Goa uh, Film Bazaar. Uh, NFDC. NFDC. Um, and they do a really good job with it. Um, from there, I got selected in Rotterdam. And that was also a producer's program. And then I did a producer's program in Cannes. And uh, post all of this, I did TAP. Uh, transatlantic partnership and that's where I really educated myself about co-production and that there's a possibility of raising money in different parts of the world where India has treaties and uh, I only realized that India and France treaty was signed in 1985 and never been used Mm. so we were the first ones to use it in 2012 Mm. and um, uh, so after that I was excited about um trying to use co-production treaties and see how we can get into uh, government financing and pre-sales in different parts of the world and raise that money and use it to make films in India and uh, and also raise money from India. So while that was my learning on one side, I met Ritesh again in Film Bazaar and uh, Ritesh was pitching another project altogether and uh, we loved that project and we started working on it together. And uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant writer. He's a very gifted writer, director, and very sensitive. And somewhere down the line, we were ready to shoot a whole new project. Mm. And somewhere down the line, he was like, I have another idea. I want to go write Lunchbox. And I was the one saying, "Uh, maybe we should do this one first. Now we are so far along. And he's like, no, no, let me just write it. And I was like, okay. So I think Lunchbox is a film that just came with its own destiny. Mm. You know, we. I always believe stories find you. You know, it's uh, they they choose you as mediums to be told. Mm. And I think in within a month, Ritesh turned around a script, and from that day, that script just worked. You know, mm. we forgot about the previous project. In fact, we had uh, Ritesh came from a. He had worked in Tribeca uh, as the programming team, and then he had worked in Doha. Mm. So he came from a whole international world perspective of uh, packaging, financing, making movies and understanding independent international films. And Ritesh uh, brought a lot of that insight and uh, he was uh, the one who had applied to all uh, script labs around the world with his previous film. Mm. And we would go there and say, actually, now we want to talk about Lunchbox. Mm. We would get selected and we would talk about Lunchbox. And uh, we got into uh, Dubai co-production market. We were in Berlin Ale co-production market, which is very big. We were in Rotterdam, Berlin. We won an award in Rotterdam. Then we were in Berlin. Then we from Berlin, we got a scholarship with the Torino Film Lab. Mm. And we were mentored there in terms of script. 
um which is very very prestigious mm. and uh, we had our workshops in malta mm. so it just i think a year went into just getting the script in place and getting mentorship and getting uh, partners and making those applications so it's a lot of patience and mm. it is a lot of work and it is very different from the so way india works so how long was that process from by the time you had a script to by the time you were shooting a year a year okay almost a year yeah but um, it was exciting i mean really the film had its own destiny mm. you know so you think that the the way the financing is structured then affects the way a film comes absolutely. out absolutely i mean you get into the reason that our france box office is uh, so significant and our germany box office is so significant and then of course the film really worked around the world um but the fact that we have the partners we have that kind of perspective and uh, we have the partners talking about the project from when it is written to when mm. it is released in the local market mm. to the distributors to the marketing people and that insight helps you on how to navigate festivals so what did that experience then teach you in terms of just how to get a film out into the world I mean of course it taught me um uh, internationally um that was the first time we saw a breakout you know mm. we will just talk about a breakout but it was really a breakout and in 2 days in 48 hours the whole world territories were sold in can yeah. when the film premiered and leading up to that was before one month i was trying to sell it in india and i showed it to every studio and i showed it to everybody i was hosting screenings and nobody wanted to touch the film bahut slow hai art house hai mm. what is this you know uh, it's not a young film youth will not connect 19 to 21 are the people who go to theaters so i was given all these marketing ideas who will come to theaters to see this film mm. so we were told that and somewhere you know you start hating yourself it's such an isolating process of making movies mm. and then you're so insecure and at the end of it i mean you know that you've pulled off something mm. but you're constantly looking for validation in people's eyes you know you're constantly tumhe achhi lagi kya laga you know mm. it's or like what do you think what do you think it's yeah. it's so isolating you know yeah. to put them so then whole process when, when when that's the case then how do you kind of overcome that and not not kind of listen to those naysayers and keep going you just keep going there is no there is no way i mean uh, even haram ko released after 5 years and still pedlers monsoon shoot out is still not released but what is the choice i mean either you um, be depressed and mm. suicidal or mm. you keep going and mm. next day next day and i keep trying i'm still trying mm. you know so my struggle is not over i mean mm. i still have movies that are not released and uh, it's hard it's hard to have these conversations here and in fact for lunchbox i met karan for the first time in my life in can he was there with bombay talkies mm. and i had produced anurag's bombay talkie uh, there were four films that mm. i was one so i'd handled anurag's film and that's how i got a chance to meet uh, karan and he was having dinner and i just walked up to him shamelessly and i said could you please look at my film it's a love story could you please release it maybe you can release it nobody in india wants to touch it the whole world is sold mm. and he was like sure why don't you meet me this is my number and that's how that conversation started mm. but yeah i was pretty shameless mm. and uh, so is that the key being shameless you have to i think uh, but but with a little bit of style with a little <laughs> bit of courtesy you mm. can't just be barging into people's life i mean i went i introduced myself and i said sir can i please talk to you can i please take a moment and then i just you know you have to uh, i think one has to be relentless you know i mean uh, and uh, one has to be subtly persuasive it is an art art right so those moments when kind of your confidence does your confidence get shaken does it shake you to that extent that your confidence is completely shaken in yourself or is that always kind of now you found a way to keep that going you know uh, my confidence got shaken after lunch box not before lunch box before lunch box i was naive and bright and shiny and i was always like there's nothing that is impossible we'll make this happen mm. but after lunch box i realized uh, the reality that my movies uh, are hard to release mm. here and when that dawned on me mm. while i was making them we entered it with a lot of with complete naivety with wide eyed 
nobody is giving us money we raised money on facebook you know mm. we were against everything all odds in mm. making things happen uh, film peddlers is a movie that we made in uh, we made through facebook financing and it went to can mm. you know brilliantly Um, yeah, that's an incredible story. Your journey with that. The yeah, and I mean the credit goes to Vasan Bala, the writer director. Mm. Um, I saw the film at Mami. Lovely film. Thank you. Yeah, you know. Very uh, powerful film. Yeah, and I wish. I mean, it's a dream for the film to come out. It's, it's one of our biggest hopes and biggest dreams, and it needs to come out properly in style. I think. Mm. what anurag went through those 5 7 years of no releases mm. um my journey of that started after lunchbox where just it just keep struck to me that it is so hard and i exactly knew what karan johar and utv pulled off for lunchbox mm. um it was even harder and tougher for me to do that for peddlers haram kor monsoon jurat mm. and uh, that led me into a very deep dark depression and that led my spirit to be killed for a couple of years mm. and i would just again relentlessly keep trying keep meeting people keep meeting studios but keep running getting rejected the whole censor conversation a films not releasing they make you feel bad of making mm. uh you've made something now you only deal with it it is your problem mm. and then i started understanding what the distribution system is in india and why i went very deep into research of distribution and why is it that we can't do so what did you discover we are a very uh, least theater populated uh, for hindi language mm. actually i was having this conversation with uh, deepthi uh, mm. when i had her on deepthi tikuna and we were look i was actually i had done some research and it was literally like numbers of screens for the number of people we have is ridiculous yeah it's nine to. screens a million people then right. yeah it's nine screens a million people for hindi language mm. but that totally changes in regional mm. uh, there are 2000 screens for telugu you know mm. there are uh, similar kind of screens for tamil so and it's very dense and there is and it's much cheaper to see these films mm, right. and uh, the marketing costs are much cheaper um for hindi language you have to do pan india marketing and everything is sold every year from newspaper spot to tv spot to radio spot so it's a it's almost like you can't even exist as independent films and you always end up cutting a sorry figure that mm. i don't have enough you know mm. i don't have enough to do that because they make you feel what is normal is so high end and mm. it's so expensive so so we have as as hindi language i think driven ourselves to the ground where only big star cast films with the kind of marketing cost that they put has led to even small films uh, normal cost be 5 crores 4 crores 6 crores something like that mm. and while we were taking pride in making movies under 2 crores mm. you know how does one justify cost of 4 to 6 crores for marketing you know mm. and So, so so you're saying 2 crores would just be the budget of the film and then you need over that you need about 4 5 crores just to market it market and release it okay. so that happened to indian independent films and that was that happened and i realized it uh during that time that marketing is so difficult mm. that that really uh shook my core belief on why i was doing what i was doing and how can we help and how we can change it so it took me few years to research it it took me some conversations mm. to do and we were able to do something with haram kor but mm. only after we won the court case for ua it was pretty mm. much banned mm. but after we won the court case and we got ua um, i was able to release that film in uh, 70 lakhs mm. and was able to do a box office of 2 crores which is a huge success mm. uh, to be able to pull that off mm. but that came with relationships that one has built with lot of support system from the alternate marketing fields like AIB mm. uh like book my show mm. like facebook mm. uh, youtube so those relationships and those conversations where you know we've seen a growth of alternate media mm. we've seen a growth of digital media we've seen a growth of alternate marketing mm. needs to balance out and then relooked at independent films and their releases mm. we cannot actually go with traditional media because traditional media is bizarrely expensive right. and only built for uh, uh for that kind high of high star value high budget films mm. 
So for Haram Court, then you used only non-traditional media. Absolutely, we didn't have a single newspaper ad. We didn't have a single TV ad. Mm. Um, we worked very closely with Facebook and AIB and YouTube, mm. and that was our only marketing and book my show. So then, uh, your marketing cost then you said that was before five crore would be a traditional marketing. Yeah, our marketing cost, including prints, mm. was seventy lakhs. Wow. Including the prints of release was seventy lakhs, and we managed to do a box office of two crores, which is just beautiful. Mm. I mean, on its own, the film, the trailer went viral. It was India's number one trending video on YouTube for mm. two three days, mm. and uh, uh, it really just happened on the merit of the film. And this is a film that. I think I would have done around 300 screenings and 300 rejections mm. over a period of five years. Wow. So it's not easy, and then you have to justify to the talent in the film that what have we done? While we love the film, while mm. we, um, uh, but what is it that we've done that it is not releasing? You do start feeling incapable or not good enough. Mm. You know that I cannot last this wave. But yeah, I. Did feel that way for a couple of years, mm. and then uh, researched more, studied more, met more people, had more mm. conversations, and drew a lot of strength from what uh, there's so much alternate media happening. In. There was Bhuvan Bam, mm. who's a big YouTuber, who was uh, very supportive for Haram Court. So you know, there's just so many amazing different avenues to market and release a film now mm. that uh, was not there in 2012. Twelve when we made Peddlers and we went to Cannes, which was not there when right. Haram Khor uh, won at Ifla and won around the world, and when Monsoon Shootout was playing. So those are there as of 2016 and 17. Mm. So I just think that uh, now it is the time to actually uh, be alternate mm. and celebrate alternate, and we are talking about alternate. Mm. So yeah. And there's also the the whole uh, digital landscape is also changing uh, with Netflix and Amazon and uh, yeah, there's real buyers and there's real money mm. for digital for uh, something that you would initially get like twenty thousand for digital rights. Now you can get up to two crores. I mean, it's mm. really really changed. And mm. now is the time to make um, good alternate stuff. Yeah, you mentioned in. Uh, in a couple of interviews that budgeting was like critically important so what's your kind of secret sauce to like budgeting a film i mean i really feel that a budget fails the film and nothing else you know i feel there is a way of telling every possible story and there is a way of making it happen it's mm-hmm. hard but if that is the route you choose there is a way of telling the story your numbers have to be right and uh, there's no secret sauce i mean the more you work in the industry the more you um work on your own uh, instinct of the business you understand what the number should be for a certain film with a certain actor without a certain actor so you get to that sweet spot and then working backwards on how many number of days this can be done in what is the kind of equipment what is the kind of you know you get into the nitty gritties of it but it just comes with uh, experience and practice Mm. and yeah and you actually had mentioned that you learned a lot from michael winterbottom when you worked with him on trishna so yes, what was that experience like vasan and i were on trishna and vasan was an associate director and i was uh, uh, handling the production um and a co-producer attached um i got that opportunity of course because of anurag and uh, it was just phenomenal to see him work with literally seven people on set mm. and uh, we work with a lot of people yeah and I mean. he would just like shoot for 8 hours without break straight on um no hair and makeup touches in between um and this is while he was working here in india yeah we shot trishna across rajasthan and bombay mm. and working closely with him uh, led us to be able to uh put together the team of peddlers and that there is a possibility of working with micro micro crew mm. and uh, with literally 8 to 10 people is your entire crew so then how does that work i know right now it's like literally one piece of equipment comes with one person yeah it's crazy so uh, one like camera comes with four people right one light comes with two people, two people right so you can't get all this <laughs> 
so you get different equipment and you have deals like at least for Trishna we had uh, a high insurance for cameras so that we kept telling them that we don't need so many people on set and and we take responsibility of it and um, and also what Trishna did that they would have a base camp where in the morning one makeup and costume and everything will happen and none of that will be on set Mm. um with the um, with peddlers i can tell you that our editor was also the first ad which is prerna which mm-hmm. goes back to my mm. story of my childhood, childhood best friend she's an editor and also first ad she was mm-hmm. also the first ad on lunchbox mm. so yeah it really each and every person does multiple jobs uh, the other ad also does costumes and uh, there is no money for hair and makeup and mm. actors do it themselves and mm. then it's a spirit you know and you can't put a value to this spirit you can't put that this should be this much it's more like what all can we do to pull this off mm. it is like a college thesis project which you do after working for 10 years in the industry and you say now i know people i can take favors and i really know what we are doing and we really want to pull this off but uh, it is off center so it needs to be done in a certain way Mm. So that's how the funding happened across um, Facebook. I mean, yeah, I think it is something that you can say that is your complete passion project. Um and then you hope the world will see it and like it and resonate with it. Uh but we were not ready to play this whole game of marketing and distribution and mm. yeah. Okay, we'll take a small break right now and when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, Kavi, uh the film that uh, went to the Oscars. Are you confused about your future education options? Not sure about whether you should be doing an MBA or if design school is the right fit for you? Are you worried about how you would finance your education? Find answers to this and a lot more education related topics on this podcast. Hi, my name is Akhil Daswani. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OnCourse. Hi, my name is Alisha Mashrawala. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OnCourse. And we both are your co-hosts for the OnCourse podcast. Tune in every Monday on the IVM podcast app. or any other podcast app you may like and we're back we're talking to gunit monga on anything but bollywood uh so i wanted to ask you about your film uh, kavi which uh, went to the oscars so when you the first time you kind of got onto the world stage was with uh, kavi the that won the student oscar yes so what was that uh, journey like um so i met the director he was here to do his thesis film and i was uh, early up line producing international films and uh, he wanted to do his student thesis film for usc mm. and i got involved and i produced the film um uh, little did i know that a year later it would go up to win the student oscar he did his post in us and uh, it and it just came to us as like really it's so amazing i mean it was all is a good script and uh the director had uh, a great idea and i mean as a producer on the film i mean we did the casting the locations and all the favors that we could pull in in india to make a short film happen it was shot in film uh we shot in y but uh, yeah didn't really know about student oscars it really happened as a beautiful gift and a blessing in life but uh, that happened in early 2010 when i found out that we were in the top 5 in oscars Mm. in the main ceremony and uh, the ceremony was within a month and uh, at that point of time i was just epically broke and i had no money mm. to go to uh, oscars not even the visa and there was there was no way mm. and uh, but i was sure that i really really wanted to go with the uh, main actor who was a boy from uh, from a slum background mm. uh, yeah. because he was kavi in mm-hmm. the film and the first ad vikas chandra who um, was translating the film and making this was a hindi language film you know who actually worked hard a lot mm-hmm. and made this happen so i was sure that at least these two need to go and i need to go and we need to experience oscars i mean it's any producer director's dream to yeah. experience oscars academy awards but we had no money and i would just like you know I made a budget and uh, we needed to go and I would write to every rich person every night from Richard Branson to Ratan Tata <laughs> to Vijay Mallya I would find their PR email IDs and I would just research research and again you know I think just being so naive that just writing these emails and saying we are the pride of India and we really need to travel and please give us some money 
or or sponsor tickets or show or or this thing and and uh, I remember I wrote to British Airways, I wrote to everybody, I wrote to Air India, Kingfisher, everything that I was available at that point of time to their assistants. I did hear from British Airways that and they said that you know if you were ever nominated for a BAFTA, I mean we can consider <laughs> but Oscars really. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you're right. I was. I was just trying my luck. Mm. And every day I would show up in the office and say, now I wrote an email to these 10 more people. And uh, it was literally like I was made fun of. And then I got frustrated and I wrote to the president of India. I wrote to uh, Ms. Pratibhava Patil. And uh, I heard from Rashtrapati Bhavan the next day. Oh. And uh, they were like, uh, yes, what are you looking for? And I said, firstly, we would like to show you the film. Mm. And... Uh, we were like okay and Kingfisher had reverted back to me saying we don't do international tickets we only do national so I got a letter from Rashtrapati Bhavan I called up Kingfisher and I was like can you give me 24 tickets because I want to take the whole crew <laughs> to Delhi I mean we were three of us who wanted to go to US but mm. uh, at least 20 of us can go to 24 of us can go to they were like no <laughs> we cannot give you 24 <laughs> free tickets we can give you 12 and I was like, okay, give me 24 one way, we'll come back on a train. Mm. And we went, all of us went to <laughs> Rashtrapati Bhavan for a screening. Mm. And there I met, um, and uh, our president was not free to see the film, but they'd organized lunch and there was some budget meeting happening. But I did uh, meet um, uh, Mr. Prithvi Raj Johan, who then went on to be the CM of uh, Maharashtra. Mm. And he invited us to his house to see the film and he engaged with us and spoke to me. And I was like, I don't have a visa. I mean, Sagar, who's played Kavi, doesn't even have a passport. Mm. I don't know what do I have to even produce his uh, residence proof to make a passport. Mm. And uh, Mr. Prithi Raj Chauhan was very kind to introduce us to a lot of people. He called up the CMD of Air India, got us the tickets. Um, then uh, I got introduced to the American embassy by the head of Kingfisher. Mm. Uh, and we were welcomed in the embassy and said, congratulations, here is your visa. And then I came back to Bombay and I was introduced to, by Mr. Prithira Chauhan's assistant, I was introduced to somebody who helped us make the passport for Sagar. Then we got the visa for him. And uh, I remember doing one newspaper article um, and that led to Cox and Kings calling the journalists and saying, can we do these people stay? And we got seven days of stay by Cox and Kings in, in US, in LA. So it just all worked out and wow. we went there fully sponsored and uh, I think that was really beautiful on how it all panned out. Mm. It's an amazing story. So you basically found lots of back doors. Always. <laughs> because I think when I started, I think my dad always wanted to be in a safe position, you know. Mm. But you have a good money and a mm. decent job. Mein ho. So he wanted me to get into insurance. And uh, I think when I turned 18, I did an insurance study and I started working with Tata AG as an agent because my dad thought he can get me, his friends, as clients and I will get every year money out of insurance. And then somewhere I'll get inspired to start selling insurance. But the only thing I learned from that insurance um, study was it was a 45-day study and then you give an exam to become an agent and I did all of that. Mm. Uh, the only thing that I learned from there was that uh, they teach you that nine people say no to you for one person to say yes. Right. You know, you just have to keep going on. And that was a beautiful learning that I got from that 45 day of course. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good learning. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your parents. Uh, you've spoken about it before. Yeah. And uh, s please tell us, tell us your story. So, uh, I'm the only child uh, and my parents uh, have been uh, very kind and beautiful and given me all kinds of freedom in life. To uh, I've traveled across India in every possible school trip from class 3. I went to US when I was 12 years old uh, on a school trip again. And it was all a big deal. I come from a very humble background. I come from a middle class family and uh, uh, it was a big deal. To go to my my parents never traveled international, never went outside India, so it was a big deal for to send their daughter to America or to you know uh, to be sending me to all these school trips, and that really mm. opened up my world. Uh, and my dad wanted me to go participate in the Himalayan rally, and he had all these dreams for me, and uh, 
I went into car racing. I won very junior level uh, rallies in Delhi, uh, auto cops, mm. uh, early on when I was 18. And he was, of course, teaching me how to drive since I was 14. But we don't talk about that. So um, I think uh, I became a DJ when I was again 18, uh, and I used to play weekend nights at clubs. I just whatever I wanted to do, I was always allowed to. I would come back home at 4 a.m. and and I would drive back home, and it was always cool. Mm. So I was always brought up as, um, you know, whatever your dreams are, sure, go for it, go to the mile. In fact, he taught me how to take risks. This whole risk appetite comes from my dad. And mm. uh, uh, that, you know, he always said that when you're on the edge, just jump. You know, you'll learn to fly on the way. He used to always tell me when you have no money, just, just spend it all. You know, don't try and save because you will never really sleep hungry you will always have a roof on your head he used to really say all this you know Mm. and and uh, by the time I was 20 years old they both got very sick and my mom had cancer and my dad had kidney issues he was in dialysis and uh, in four years by the time I know I was doing Daswadanya uh, they saw Salam India and uh, by the time Daswadanya they both uh, went to the better world they both passed away and uh, and uh, then uh, my mom did hear the song, the mama song from the Sudanya, but she never saw it. And July 2008, my mom left and February 2008, my dad left. So within six months. Mm. And uh, post that, I was just, you know, I, I didn't know what to do. And I had this love and hate relationship with Delhi and I just moved bags and baggages to Bombay and just worked. And uh, yeah and for five six years just worked and I did not I did not even address uh, the emotions I mean it was I I, uh, I can now maybe even talk about it and articulate it but uh, and those two years of uh, low time 2014-15 when I was deeply depressed and I was I was I had huge self-doubt on uh, how will my movies release because everything that we were doing was these movies you know mm. Uh, my life is these movies and uh, and when you're questioned to the core my faith did shake up and uh, and I realized that it was a mixture of burnout it was a mixture of not addressing the loss mm. and I just needed to take a break and uh, and just you know look inwards and I went into um, various ashrams across India and shaved my head and just whatever I wanted to do and just be away from Bombay and traveled again, mm-hmm. traveled the world, traveled, went to US, learned a lot about how English films are distributed and, uh, you know, just try to understand much deeper and understanding of our own craft and, uh, yeah, and, and drawing a lot of strength from loss. Uh, I mean, I drew a lot of strength from loss. I mean, mm. for me, it was like it can never in my life get worse than this. So it's only... Uh, it's only sunshine tomorrow morning, mm. and uh, I, and I was brought up that way. You know, my my mom was cancer stage four, and she would talk to me, and she would always talk to me. What's your plan? What's your plan? And I was like, there's no way you're going anywhere. What do you mean there's a plan? There's no plan. So you know, this they prepared me for this, mm. um, and I know that I have two angels with me, and I think a lot of my career choices, a lot of my uh, I, I give them a lot of credit mm. I've been on the deep end of crazy decisions and they've turned out in my favor mm. so there is some magic in this universe and there's some energy above and beyond us mm. which, which you know keeps all of us going on so yeah it's it's, it's a choice I mean you, you deal with the loss or you deal with bad things in a certain way either you go down or you take strength from that and mm. start working your way up so I've been on both ends. Oh, it's an incredible story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Yeah. Um, okay, so actually I just wanted to wind up. I think there's you've already given us a lot. We have a lot to learn, I think, from your journey. Everyone does. Uh, but do you have any kind of advice for filmmakers setting out to make their films today? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that uh, we all go through our ups and downs and we're all the same around the world it is not just India I mean independent filmmakers around the world have to have their challenges and make their movies and 
um i would say don't rush in making your first film your first film will always be your first film and learn the craft ask all the tough questions to yourself and then venture out when you know that after you make your first film you can fly and uh, you will not be questioned again for your second third and many more films after that i have uh, restarted many times i started my own company sikha 3 years ago after i moved on from anrakasha films and it's always hard it's always you get into self doubt on what will i do how will things work out will people accept and just by showing up every day things start happening mm. you know um uh, i would just say that just keep going on and that's there is it all starts to make sense after a couple of years it doesn't make sense when you're in it uh you don't know if a film will get into a festival you don't know if it will sell around the world you can't know all these i mean we would all be making super hits if we knew this but the idea is to just keep doing it and keep asking yourself that how can you be better than yesterday so yeah thank you that's a very good note to end on uh so our last section that we do is uh, we ask for a film recommendation so i'm going to go first and then you can think of if you have a film recommendation that you'd like to share So the film that I wanted to recommend is Mukti Bhavan I saw it this week and uh, it's a place in Banaras where people go and they wait to die and the story tells a story about this father who goes much against his son's wishes to wait there and die and the film actually it ends up being it is a story about how we deal with death and it's quite philosophical in that sense but it's not heavy handed it's a very gentle uh, quiet film and it's as much about how to live life I think um So yeah that's my recommendation. I recently saw Captain Fantastic. Uh, oh, I saw it. And I have to say that I love Mukti Bhavan and he's a brilliant brilliant director Shubhashish. Um but yeah I recently saw Captain Fantastic. Uh mm-hmm. I saw it a bit late and I've absolutely truly madly deeply fallen in love with Captain Fantastic and the philosophy of Captain Fantastic. So I would recommend everybody to see it. Yeah it's a good film. Yeah. Great great. Thank you so much Gunit for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Excuse me bhaiya. Excuse me. Bole madam. Menu mein kya hai? Menu mein seen and seen hai, podcast hai, on course hai, Cyrus says hai, Made in India, Rediscovery Project, Empowering Series, Sex Wax hai, IVM likes hai, Simplified hai, Keeping It Queer hai, Things and Destinations hai, My Neighbor Zuckerberg hai aur The Fan Garage hai. Aapko kya chahiye hai? Uh ek baar repeat kar denge kya? repeat repeat नहीं करता हम आप जाओ आई वी एम पॉडकास्ट डॉट कॉम पे और सुनो ये सब या फिर डाउनलोड करो उनका ऐप सब आपकी उंगलियों पे